Well, welcome everybody um, to this week's Midwest LaRouche organization meeting. Um, we find ourselves in a pretty wild and dangerous period in history. And I'm just gonna say a few words to, to kind of set the stage before we, we uh, proceed with the discussion tonight. And basically what I'd like to, to illustrate or give a sense of is that over the last six months, there's been a real transformation. Um, people that were working with us know that there was a real push for most of last year into the um, conference in, in Scotland, in Glasgow, of the COP26 um, climate change stuff, which was essentially a move to enforce global depopulation worldwide. Um, there was a huge push around the developing world to accept non, you know, uh, anti-carbon emissions, which totally failed. And for a period, this was uh, a very, you know, it was a very interesting dynamic that the, the, the global British empire was on its heels. Um, as this year has started, and frankly, towards the end of last year and somewhat immediately after this summit failed, in October, November, there's been a very real, um, very rapid push for confrontation with Russia. And this has happened in the domain of Ukraine. Um, there have been similar moves now with what happened in Kazakhstan last week, um, last two weeks, I suppose, which was, was a very interesting situation. Maybe we can go into that more um, if people have questions, but um, I just want to reference that it was could have been very bad and it was stopped. And I'll say a couple things just about what's happened because this week was a very um, dramatic week in terms of diplomacy. There was a there was a meeting with uh, between the US and NATO. Um, I believe Monday and Tuesday, or maybe it was Tuesday, and then today was the meeting with the US and Russia over this question with Ukraine. And what people know, the, the, um, the NATO and, and American line has been basically consistent, which is we don't acknowledge your fear over NATO moving eastward, which uh, Ukraine is on the border of Russia. So it's about as east as you can get. Um, which uh, under the NATO guidelines could include everything up to offensive um, missiles, potentially nuclear missiles, right on Russia's border, minutes from Moscow. So the U.S. is saying we refuse to acknowledge that this is a threat. You're just being, um, you're just revamping the Cold War and want control over you know, other smaller nations and you're a big bully. So we're gonna exert democracy and, you know, put Ukraine and our nuclear missiles under, under our wing. And it's extremely insane. And the meeting the last couple of days seemed to have a very similar tone, unfortunately. And I will read a couple of things from the Russian side in response. Um, in fact, actually, one of them was before the meeting, I believe this was yesterday. Um, but the um, Russian representative meeting, um, a guy named Grushko, he had said in response of the, of the you know, basically what the, what the result of was the meeting today, there was no unifying positive agenda between Russia and NATO. This might have been yesterday. Um, he said that um, he said that the NATO bloc has resorted to full Cold War containment and seeks full spectrum dominance over Russia. And we believe that NATO's behavior is creating a threat to Russia that Russia will have to counter. And then he went on to say, if they continue to use these kinds of tactics and this kind of intimidation, 
we will be forced to respond in kind. Now, while the, the Americans said something similar, another one of um, uh, a member of the Russian Valdai Club, who has been around many of these discussions, although he's not a direct participant in the, in the diplomacy, he said something, I think it's even more puts a sharp point on it, which is, um, if NATO continues to reject Russia's request to stop moving eastward um, and therefore incorporate Ukraine, Russia will have to make important decisions. First on the ways to ensure a guarantee um, of NATO's non-expansion eastward. But I think there is no alternative to a further escalation of tension, military pressure, of our military pressure on NATO and the United States. So just wanted to point out that we live in a very dangerous world. And we live in a situation where we are backing the, the other biggest nuclear superpower into a corner. Um, we have a pathetic amount of leadership in the world that is responding to this. Um, we, we really do have a decadent um, political and official class in the West that is, is very much failing to respond to this um, as, a, as a cultural inability to respond, like a, like, a, like a blindness to reality kind of thing. And um, in and, and an increasingly decadent and problematic situation in the United States. So it's what we're gonna talk about tonight and I wanna turn it over to, um, to others here is in a situation like this where there is not a clear pathway for, for where we go, for, for where a solution can come, then the question I think has to be asked, well, what does one do? Um, where, where does one put, put one's uh, hopes and energy and thoughts in order to create a new pathway? Um, so I just want to leave it at that and turn it over to Anastasia, who I think has a couple things to introduce. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Um, I just want to, people know that I, I'm the editor-in-chief of Leonora Magazine, uh, Schiller Institute's uh, new magazine that we're putting out. And this last issue, we go through what is an aesthetical education? And in there, I, I go through in the beginning, just this idea of why do we educate people in the first place? What's the point of it? Why do we educate people? Because if you look at the situation, like you were just going through, Stuart, you have to ask yourself, well, how are all these people who are in high positions of power, leaders of governments, presidents of nations, or even just you know, maybe not even people who are in positions of, of so-called power, why are they incapable of understanding what's necessary to move forward humanity? And that's where we come in as an organization. That's where all of you who have been um, blessed enough to run into us at some point or another um, and be exposed to these kinds of ideas that we have a certain responsibility not only to educate ourselves, but to be able to do that to other people. And uh, Mrs. LaRouche, Ms. Helgetzep LaRouche has really emphasized this point that what we're really looking at is the lack of agopic love. And when you think about that, you know, a lot of people have funny ideas about love. It's often romantic, very, very, very romantic. They're like, oh, mi amor, oh, Romeo and Juliet. They have all these funny ideas or they think that if, you're, if you love somebody, you'll die for them. You know, some pretty, pretty wild ideas. Probably the closest thing that people really experience as serious love is love for their children or their grandchildren. Um, but for the most part, it, it does tend to be very fantasy written. And that's expressed in a lot of tragedies we've seen throughout history. And the way that you get to this higher level of love, as opposed to just saying, you know, I'm gonna 
chase people around or, or create fantasies for myself. You get to that by making fundamental breakthroughs of how the world works, right? If you think about what happens with a child when a child is working on a problem and they're struggling and they're working with the teacher and then they, they finally, they come to a point where they can see there's something there to solving this problem. And when they figure out that problem, they, they you know, wanna yell out, like, oh, I did it, I finally get it, I understand what's going on, I get how to solve this problem. And they wanna tell not only their teacher, but they wanna tell everybody. They wanna tell everybody how to solve these kinds of problems. And it's, it's that quality that we have to tap into right now. This ability to not only, you know, to, to be excited about what it means to be human, but to find that strength within yourself to be able to help other people figure out how to be human. That's so something in our culture right now, which is, is really, really lacking. It's lacking, um, you know, I mean, I, I feel really sorry for, you know, what you're seeing in the schools right now, let alone, you know, the COVID situation, but just, you know, between the, the social media, aspect of things, the fact that people, there's something called hyperlinking, Lainey and I were just talking about this the other day, you know, where people have a hard time concentrating on one thing, where they're, they're looking at, you know, five, six different things, and they're bouncing around, and they can't stick to one idea for more than, you know, 20 minutes is considered a long time at this point to keep concentration. Um, so we really want to fight to get people to, to understand this quality. You know, obviously, uh, many of you have really been struggling, you know, with that. And you've been working very hard uh, to organize with us. Uh, we definitely encourage you to do more of that. Uh, definitely get this magazine, uh, the Leonora magazine, and you can subscribe to that and get that out to other young people that you know. Uh, we'll be having a meeting this Saturday with Mrs. LaRouche uh, for youth all over the world. Uh, we're expecting to have a pretty good turnout but it's going to be on Operation Even Cena, where we're discussing how do you educate uh, a population so we can create a world health system? You know, how do we get to this situation where we're not only solving the problems of uh, financial and economic collapse, but we shouldn't have pandemics. We shouldn't have 45 million people on the verge of starvation, right? This, this just should not be happening. We're in the 21st century, this should not be happening. And the youth of the world have got to demand this. Um, so we're gonna have uh, a really good time uh, organizing uh, in the United States and in many other countries to make this happen. Uh, but I wanted to set the, the stage for Laney, you know, and what we're, we're working on and what we're attempting to do uh, with this youth movement. So definitely please join us on Saturday, it'll be at 11 a.m. Uh, if you have any young people around, definitely um, get them on, on board with that. Uh, but Lainey's gonna go through more of this, of this quality that we're talking about um, that Schiller, Schiller really gets at. Oh, you've got to unmute yourself there, Lainey. First, hello everyone, particularly to Kevin Pearl, because I saw you, Kevin, with a glass of wine in your hand. So that's a good sign uh, that you're getting better. So all, all, uh, all the best, Kevin. <laughs> so I heard you were very sick. So this is not a- Thank you. This, yeah. <laughs> this is not a class class because this was sprung upon me last night. So um, I am going to begin to ask you a question and this is not a rhetorical question. Um, Anastasia has touched upon it already in different ways, uh, but I would ask you to just come out with what you think. What is the very most important thing needed to create a good future for mankind? What is the very most important thing? It's not a rhetorical question. You have to kind of say something. Yeah, Arnold? Our cooperation. 
cooperation is good. Other, uh, other suggestions? The very most important thing. Come on, guys. I think <laughs> yeah. what Anastasia touched on regarding uh, love for your neighbor, essentially, that agopic love certainly has to be there. Mm -hmm. Good. Other suggestions? Come on, guys. I can just see all these kind of. Yep. Anybody? Yep. Steve? Uh, I think you want to be effective and powerful to affect change, progress. Well, how are you effective and powerful? <clears throat> well, uh, by recognizing your, your own limitations and, uh, and uh, seeing how the universe itself is powered and which is bigger than you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other suggestions? What do you think, Pam? Kate? Uh, principled? Principal, okay. Brian, do you have any ideas? Ideas. Ideas. That's not bad, yes. Ideas, agape, principles, collaboration, power. <laughs> Stephen said. Um, you know, one thing, Lainey, which, yeah. which, we, which we hear a lot from young people on the campuses is that we have to change the system. That's what that's one response that I would imagine we'd hear. Okay. Well, the the absolute most important thing for changing the future is to create a, a condition where every single child can be able to unfold his or hers uh, powers for creative thinking and love that is inherent or inalienable in each person being born into, into this world. Um, and some of it, what the suggestions were, like Brian said, ideas and so forth. I mean, what makes us uniquely different is that we are able to be creative, to create, as I know that many of you went through LaRouche's book, No Limits to Growth, that uh, we are able to define new uh, part of the world as our resources. Once it was wood and then it was oil and coal and fission and fusion and so forth. But there's more to it than that. I mean, LaRouche often used to say uh, that the most despicable thing concerning keeping Africa colonized and poor is all the Beethovens that never were allowed to be developed in Africa. If you think about Africa's uh, population, the majority, a huge part is young people, the same for India and so forth, that what we represent and what the power of uh, LaRouche and our movement is that we think that people are important, the more the better, uh, that uh, to have a world where we collaborate using the utmost of each person's capability to develop a future for mankind. And it can be really difficult. I mean, I told Stuart Lay earlier today, I said, look, when I met the organization in, in the spring of 1975, I was a good person. I worked with, so to speak, good person. I was a teacher. I love to teach. I um, worked with former hearing addicts. I did, I was in the lead of the teachers union and things like that. Uh, but then I met LaRouche and I had thought that uh, poverty was something that you just would have all the time. Uh, and I used to send money to Africa to feed children every year. And then I realized this was all political that uh, there was absolutely 
no reason for it. There was a solution to the poverty. And although I loved my job, uh, I realized that I could help a few kids in the school, but I could be more important in changing the conditions for the world, stopping being a teacher. So, uh, so, so how, when you're a young person, we have a really senior guy here, L, but when you're a younger person and you look at what the situation is, I mean, from when I joined till now, with social, culturally, moral, economically, everything is going down, legalization of drugs. You, you know it all. You heard about the fires in the Bronx that killed people. People died in flooding uh, and legalization of drugs. I think I said that. So, uh, so how, and then all your friends, uh, so-called friends around you are, uh, in this culture, how do you do it? How do I get the strength internally to decide and to know, uh, find a pathway how to uh, look to develop my inner strengths and seek truth? How do I do that? How do I develop my capability for agape, as Isa mentioned? Um, uh, I I thought I had a very small heart. I, I told Anastasia the other day because Helga told me when I joined, she said, you have to love the whole world. And a week later, I called her and said, Helga, I don't think I can be a member because if I'm totally truthful, I don't love the whole world. And she laughed and I was really upset with her because that was very serious for me. And she said, Lini, if you work on it, your heart will grow. And then we had a long discussion how to get your heart to become bigger. See, the thing is that unless you love yourself, not in a ego way, look at me, but unless you love yourself for what is in you potentially and get to love yourself more because you overcome yourself and speak out as your own individual sovereign person, despite all the attacks you'll get and so forth, uh, then you begin to love yourself. And it's first when you love yourself that you're capable of bigger love for the whole, for mankind as a whole. And then you begin, as Sheila says in universal history, then you begin to have a, a, um, a uh, idea that you are part of the human species and not just a Dane where I come from or an American or not, but we are one humankind and that your life, even if you're not important, even if you're not famous, that what you, what you participate in doing when you are alive will have an influence on future generations to come. And that makes your life worthwhile living. That makes you, you, your life gets a purpose, which I never, when I grew up in Denmark, and I had, you know, I came from the middle class, pretty good education, but I never learned that my life had a purpose. Uh, so, okay, you have an education, you get a job, you get children, you become a grandma, and that's kind of your life. It's much, much worse today where people have no idea uh, what, why they are here and what their life is supposed to be. So what I would like to, so, we have all these helpers. We have Socrates, we have Confucius, we have an Ibn Sina, what Helga has called upon. Uh, we, we just, if you look, if you take uh, the greatest people from the different nations, we have a, we have an o oasis, or, not an oasis, we have a, uh, this horn where everything flows out of, I forget the name now, it, uh, uh, Cornucopia of beautiful people from the history that we can learn from. Um, so then there's so many. So that, then the question is who to choose and in what order. And Lynn gives a very good idea about that in the latest issue of Leonora, uh, how to educate younger people. And if you're not young anymore, or young, young, uh, you can still go for his, uh, how to build upon uh, uh, earlier, 
uh, insights into new insights and become more and more happy about yourself, loving yourself, as I said before. So, uh, and because I could mention a whole series, but what I will, of good people to, to, uh, to take up, but what I would like to do is to get people a little taste for uh, Schiller that don't, that haven't encountered him before. Many of you I know have, but maybe not for what we are going to do now. Um, and I would like it to be a discussion, what you think about it. Uh, it's mainly addressed, the two things that Anastasia is going to read up is addressed to young people. Uh, and then we have a surprise in the end. Um, so, yeah, let's just do that. Let's Anastasia take from the, which is kind of part of the introduction of the aesthetic education of man in a series of letters that Schiller wrote. Uh, and I have asked Anastasia to read two sections that are very, very beautiful in German, but you still get the ideas in the English, uh, a passage from letter eight and a passage from letter nine. No, no. Mm -mm. Dare to be wise. No, not right. Dare to be wise. Energy of courage is needed to overcome the obstacles which both the inertia of nature and the cowardice of heart place against instruction. It is not for nothing that the ancient myth lets the goddess of wisdom emerge fully armed from Jupiter's head. For her very first function is warlike. Already at birth, she has to endure a hard struggle with the senses which do not want to be dragged from their sweet repose. The greater part of humanity is too exhausted and fatigued from the struggle with need to rally itself to a new and more difficult struggle with erroneous ideas. Content to escape the hard labor of thought, man gladly, <clears throat> man gladly resigns to others the guardianship of his concepts. And if it happens, that higher needs stir in him. He seizes with eager faith the formulas which the state and priesthood hold in readiness for this occasion. If these unfortunate humans deserve our compassion, our just contempt strikes those others whom a better lot has freed from the joke of necessity, but by their own choice continue to stoop beneath it these men prefer the twilight of obscure concepts in which feeling is livelier and where improvisation at its own pleasure forms comfortable gestalts to the beams of truth which chase away the pleasant phantoms of their dreams. On these very deceptions which the hostile light of cognition should dis dissipate have they based the whole structure of their happiness and they are supposed to purchase a truth so dearly that it begins by depriving them of everything they value. In order to love wisdom, they would have to be wise already, a truth which was already felt by the man who gave philosophy its name. It is therefore not enough to say that all enlightenment of understanding only deserves our respect insofar as it acts upon our character. It proceeds to a certain extent from the character because the way to the head must be opened through the heart. Development of Infindungsvermögen, Infindungsvermögen 
is therefore the most urgent need of our age, not merely because it becomes a means of making the improved insight active in life, but even because it awakens one to the improvement of insight. Okay. Um, Empfindungsvermögen, uh, LaRouche had put that in, in the German too, in one of his writings. So I did the same thing uh, in the translation because there is not an English word for it. It means uh, what Isa brought up, brought up, the capacity to uh, have empathy for the whole world, uh, to, to take people into your own mind and heart and doing that be strengthened by that. That is, Sheila says that unless you have that capacity, it's not enough just to read and be really smart. Uh, unless you have the Empfindungsvermögen, the capacity for taking other people into your mind and heart, uh, you, you will not be able to, to get to the truth. You will not be able to think on a higher level and find solutions to problems and so forth. That this is an absolutely necessity that this is there. So I'm very happy that Isa brought that up when I asked for all these different questions. But also, it might be a little bit of a mouthful. I don't know if people have any questions to this before we go on with the next quote. I mean, the first thing, dare to be wise. You have to not be scared. If you just went out of high school and not even to get a high school degree, every one of us is born with the capability for uh, becoming geniuses. With zest and whatever. But maybe you can put up the other one you read before. So oh, Linda's can... got her hand raised. Okay, Linda. You are muted. Linda, you are muted. Can you unmute her? No? No. You have to push the little button in the left corner of your screen. Oh, there we go. go. Okay. Uh, sorry. It, I uh, thought that um, the carriage question was one important thing. And it is not just a love, it is love, agape. But sometimes people don't think of it as love of them. You know, you have to love yourself as you were speaking. In other words, to, before you could let in the world to love or before you could grasp the world. It is often, um, as I remember coming into the organization, it was before that, it was more what I did not want to be. You know, you canceled out things. No, no, that's, that's the negative. That's not what I'm thinking but I did not have a sense of it until I met the organization. What is it conceptualized uh, that you want to be? It was not so much that you had a love of yourself, but it was a love also that you recognize that love was not enough. When it came to situations like what I would see was 14 year olds who are left in a closet all their lives. You know, you, went, you can love, you. oh my God, these children, you need to help them. But no, that's not enough. You need to know. You need to know at least, at least, to recognize that just you to working these children is not enough. You have to go above, so that you say, "Wait a minute, what is the problem here? What is the principle we have to get at that this would not happen again?" Fourteen-year-olds only that could not stand on their own. That's just three feet high. This kind of thing I would say, and I say, "No, it is. That is not enough to love." Because you could be there day in and day out, and I hadn't, didn't have the strength. But it is also the conception that you have to do more to get to a higher level to solve this issue, that you don't have this issue again, you just, this crisis, this abuse again, that's all. And But then you see that on a larger level, of course, right? Of course, na the nations of Africa and the rest. You, it's not enough, enough to become a, a person who wants to help one to one is not enough. One to one nation is not go become a Peace Corps person or whatever. That's good, but that's not enough. The whole world is there beckoning. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. 
Is that helpful? Am I clear? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure. So I, I hope I mean and I I hope I was clear enough when I say to love yourself. Um like children don't really know what love is when they say I love your mom, I love your dad, until so they're at least eight or ten years old and maybe even older. That unless and before you have this I have discovered uh, your own powers and a ability to to uh, push forward um your your heart you, your heart is still too small you uh, and if if you are not free with yourself in that way and self confident is another word but i i think love is better um then you are not going to uh, be able to do uh, what your capability is to be able to do concerning embracing the entire world. Yeah, just one thought on that, Lainey, is that um, that if you don't have that love, this idea of, of um, you know, what we're talking about with agopic love, which isn't, you know, it is that desire to fight for somebody else, to help somebody else work through something and become better. Um, if you don't have the love for yourself, you can't actually express that love to another person. Um, and if you get hit, you know, by something really hard, something hits you, some, you know, you get some lash back, somebody yells at you, flips over your table or <laughs> spits at you or something, you, you're gonna, you're gonna withdraw and you're gonna lose you know, if you don't have the confidence to stand for it, um, then you're going to lose that that drive. Yeah. Um, which is this question of the difference between being good versus, you know, being something more. We're trying to become a philosopher. Each one of us has to strive to become a philosopher king. Why not? Uh, so the next quote, actually. Um, tells about how to handle the question about the book table. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. Yeah. If then, that's how it starts. Here we go. Oops. No, nope, it's not right. I accidentally went back one. Here we go. Give then, I shall reply to the young friend of truth and beauty who wants to learn from me how he can satisfy the noble desire of his breast in the face of all the opposition of the century. Give to the world on which you act the direction toward the good and the quiet rhythm of time will bring about its development. You have given the world this direction. If by your teaching you elevate the thoughts of the age to the necessary and eternal, if by your actions or creations, you transform the necessary and eternal into an object of their drives. The structure of illusion and lawlessness will, will fall. It must fall. It has already fallen as soon as you are certain that it is tilting, but it must tilt in the inner, not only in the outer man. In the modest stillness of your heart, Nurture the triumphant truth, bring it forth from within yourself in beauty, so that not merely thought may pay homage to it, but senses too may lovingly grasp its appearance. And in order that it does not befall you to receive the exemplar from reality that you need to give it, do not dare to enter into reality's questionable company until you are insured of an ideal pathway in your heart. Live with your, <clears throat> live with your century, but be not its creature. Give to your contemporaries what they need, but not what they praise. Not having shared in their guilt, share their penalties with noble resignation and bow in freedom beneath the yoke which they can as ill dispense with as they can bear it. 
you will prove to them by the steadfast courage with which you disdain their fortune. But it is not your cowardice that submits to their sufferings. Think of them as they ought to be when you are to influence them. But think of them as they are when you try to act on their behalf. Seek their praise through their own dignity, but elevate their fortune according to their unworthiness. In that way, your own nobility will awaken theirs and their unworthiness will not destroy your purpose. The gravity of your fundamental propositions will scare them away from you, but they will still tolerate them in play. Their taste is purer than their heart. And here you must seize the timid fugitive. In vain, you will assail their maxims, in vain condemn their deeds, but you can try your, education, your educating hand on their idleness. Drive out lawlessness, fri frivolity, and coarseness from their enjoyments, and you will banish them from their actions, and finally, from their character. Wherever you find them, surround them with noble, with great, with ingenious forms, envelop them all around with the symbols of excellence until appearance overcomes reality and art overcomes nature. Okay. Any questions? Oh, uh, Linda, you are there again. I think that might be her hand still raised from the last oh, time. Okay. So <laughs> any questions, comments? Maybe we should put up the text. It might be a little heavy for people. Okay. Um, well, I'll say Lainey. Okay. When the first page, the first page of the second excerpt. Mm -hmm. Um, the, you know, he has this thing, which is very interesting about, it's really wonderful. This idea that, um, you know, you propose to them, to somebody, you know, somebody that you're trying to discuss and elevate and you get them to think, think better, be a better person. You propose to them the, the good and the true, I think is how he puts it. And once, once you're successfully doing that, they begin to um, really be moved by it, you know, because there's something within somebody that can't resist somebody else that is treating them like a beautiful human being, mm -hmm. which I think is a really wonderful idea because how many times do we think well what am i going to say to convince this person that they're wrong what do i got to do to argue with this person or you know maybe i gotta send them a nasty text message about how they're wrong <laughs> or like he says that in vain you will assail their maxims in vain condemn their deeds right 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 i mean and we know that if you say don't do gaming don't do this it doesn't function. Right. Yeah, but that there's there's something that nobody can resist unless they're just a really, really rotten soul, but most people aren't. And you know, there's something that just you can't resist about this quality of, you know, that that Schiller is calling on the true organizer to become. So I think it was really, really great. Yeah what I meant with the book table advice, which I used for years when I was in the field. Did you say this is what you used, Lainey? I was, it was a little bit muffled. Well, uh, what I used all the time was think about, so, you have to um, 
Okay, think of them as they ought to be when you are to influence them. But think of them as they are when you have to act on their behalf. And then he goes on. So if you are out organizing, it can be on the phone, it can be in the field, uh, doing door to door or whatever, you, oh yeah. Oh, anyway, uh, so if you think about them as they ought to be, it's almost like how you deal with children. Uh, you think about them or you treat them and think about how they ought to be. And then uh, you change them through that. It's a little bit like if somebody is really bitchy towards you and you don't respond as a bitch, then you will find that the person will come later on and apologize because through you not responding on their low level, they learn something. I mean, I put now on a based on level, right? But think about them as they ought to be when you have to influence them, but think about them as they are when you have to act on their behalf. And you can have both in your mind so that you think about them as they ought to be, that's a very loving gesture. And that will come true in the, if you do it, it will come through in the organizing process. That you're not, this is, you're just a greeny asshole, sorry for the expression, but that you don't do that. Uh, then you are basically on their level. You have to think about them as they ought to be and try to get up on a higher level. And that's kind of what Sheila develops throughout this quote, which I always found was a, such a great um, tool for organizing. If you are down, if, it, if you can't really figure it out, you keep your own strengths and self-confidence con and self-consciousness and think about the whole world and that will influence people through in between the lines of what you are saying if that is the intent what of what you are doing because that is what is being communicated and that's what he goes through also in the end what what Stuart pointed out does that make sense to people it's really weird to sit here with a screen I don't know how people are thinking <laughs> can people say something <laughs> please <laughs> Hey, do you think anything? Um, just with these passages, like I, I kind of had a, a similar um, kind of practical relation to it, like um, in in a sense that uh, how how often certain discussions I've been in recently um, tend toward uh, the the kind of immediate moment of um um like you'll get it's almost like a, a backhanded sort of congratulations of like you know well, we you know I, we we like to be optimistic like you are like like if, if i'm talking about possibilities in the situation um and like there was one long discussion i had today with a group of people where th that was kind of the start of it but then like um as long as i kind of like kept to what what i was seeing as a possibility in the situation and and um kind of showing it as more than just a uh an, an optimism of fantasy but but one of of going back to what i said was principle but like a certain principle that that hangs over what appears as the potentials in the current reality the, it seemed like the more that that was being able to be taken as an example the more i got that back when when people would respond to me then there's a certain contagiousness to it and mm -hmm. and this kind these passages at least uh highlighted that recent experience for me thanks for that that was good yeah no because i have found that to be absolutely the case um so good thanks <laughs> thanks for that no because if you just try to be uh okay 
we guys meet together and we discuss these things and like what you normally do in society, you don't get anywhere. And that's where it's a little, um, can be a little, I mean, I remember when uh, in Denmark, before we had the internet and things like that, when I was there, in, uh, the leading of, leader of the Danish organization, what we would do is every uh, Friday, we'd look in the newspapers and see what were their meetings in the next week that we should intervene in. And they will go there and there will be 500 people in the room and you have to go up and say something to kind of change everything. And you will be, I will not lie, sometimes it was very intimidating. And then you just knew what you knew and what is the right uh, thing, what is the truth on the higher level, what we are standing for. And you will stand up and talk. And it was invariably, there will always be people that thought the same thing in the audience, but didn't dare say it. And in that way, you get gave leadership to these other people, um, which was a great uh, teaching ground, actually, for speaking up. And if you think about it in all the, we have had a lot of, in the history of mankind, we have a lot of uh, horrific, um, dark ages, and they were overcome by individuals and their, uh, and people that followed them, or not just followed them, but collaborated with them to get to a higher level, uh, what Sheila describes in universal history. Uh, and that is really the task that we have today to strengthen ourselves individually to and every day, it's not something that you do, but every day uh, so that uh, our interventions, our actions uh, will uh, mean a change for the overall uh, pathway of where the world is going. And we have a lot of great people in the past to share that with. I mean, I'd share it with, but learn from that we are not the first ones that did that. Socrates, Plato, Ibn Sina, Kepler, Cusa, um, many, many people. Schiller, Linda LaRouche, who could have avoided going to jail, but he decided not to. Um, so uh, anybody else want to say anything about this? Otherwise we have a surprise. Yeah, let's... Um... Let's, what time is it? Um, what time is it? I don't even let's know. Let's say that, yeah, we, let's, without being too formal, yeah. um, and it, it looks like Linda has her hand up again, but okay. without being too formal, um, yeah, people should, should, let's say this is now, um, you know, people can ask any questions or thoughts or just reflections or comments are all welcome. And, um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's try to, do something like that takes it yeah and Maybe we'll start with linda can put their faces up if possible if they don't sit you can sit in your pajamas it's okay <laughs> <laughs> go ahead linda just have a shirt on yeah um okay it, well lenny i wanted to say you're not only in the when you say to uh, get into a a meeting or whatever and speak from your heart or from the truth, it, you're also uh, igniting in people, oh, that's exactly what I was thinking, but they didn't know they were thinking it. They didn't have that formulation. And gee, wh how wonderful to, you know, to unlock their their thoughts. Wow. <laughs> and get it. But also, it is with um, uh, earlier, the, uh, there was some discussion of what Hester was thinking of when you're working with children, you're, it's the same thing. You're you're getting them past their point of anger to say, what's really going on here? And you speak to them that they do have anger. Or you, maybe it's correct, maybe it's not. Well, let's find out about this. But I also had worked with people, oh, maybe 26, 27-year-olds, where they lived at home and their parents were afraid of them, literally afraid of them. 
you know, well, wait a minute. Why were they able to work with me, clean a garage, whatever? Um, well, what was it? It was they were responding to just uh, reason, just reason. No, none of the things that go on, the anger, the name calling or whatever else might go on with the youth, right? Who have never worked a day in their life and, and their parents are afraid to say anything because they're so violent. It is interesting. It is a matter, you know, it is uh, not um, that you are strong and not responding to the person, but that you say, gee, you must really be having a rough day or a rough life, whatever. We can help, you know, we can help. This is this is the problem. You're responding to all the stuff around you, not to us. Don't, you know, you don't need to turn the table up or you you don't need to do that. <laughs> it is, uh, it's really, you know, we can, other people have better ideas, I'm sure, on that. But anyway, I just was responding to you, Lenny, in terms of unlocking people's, what they have not formulated but knew something was there and you probably unlocked it as many of our organizers do on the, on the street. So I had more, but that's it. I think that's fine. Let other people speak. Thank you. Welcome. I just wanted to quickly say that I think this is really helpful. I'm um, working on organizing a teachers group in Long Island right now. Um, and I think in my background is some in, in teaching and early childhood education and that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of responses that I'm getting at this point are that unless someone has specifically dealt with the exact issue um, that these teachers are dealing with, unless you've been in the classroom every single day or you've worked, you know, specifically with maybe like special education students or encountered um, like a specific trial that's maybe even a personal problem, um, they say that they just can't relate to you. You just, or that I can't, or whomever can't relate to the other person. Um, and they have no faith in government and no faith in real change, which is very sad. Um, but it's because they haven't seen anything monumental. A lot of them are, you know, early 30s, maybe 40s. They weren't around when man was walking on the moon and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so all of this is is really helpful um, in being able to to organize in groups like that. And again, just um, remembering the importance of a child and and not and not doing the thing where we see them as a blank slate, but seeing them for their real personality and um, who they could be and their full capabilities. Exactly. Very good. Yeah who they could be, yeah. As Lynn said, all the betones that we never had from Africa because of the starvation and colonization there, yeah. That's Thank my you. favorite thing to say whenever I talk to people in like a doctor's office and they're like, the world's so bad. I just, I hope my kids don't have grandkids. And I said, your grandkid could be the next Beethoven or Einstein. Like, how could you say that? No, they could change the whole game, get excited. And see, that's exactly where we are, like, if there's a better example is we want a lot of people, we want a lot of kids, and the oligarchy want to kill as many people as possible. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yep. And Arnold? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just relate to this, uh, one of the clips that was shown of Lynn, I think in the Saturday uh, Manhattan Project, where he, he states that uh, when people look at the world from only their own perspective of their challenges, their efforts, their struggle in life, they lose because they don't have the idea of that we're all one humanity and we all really need the same things. And, and that's what we're supposed to be working for, trying to develop ourselves to achieve so that we all, you know, make humanity better for everyone. And I think these passages from Schiller are uh, part of the roots of that idea. So.
I have a quote from LaRouche, My People Are Thinking, uh, which I put in the article in the latest Leonora, which I really like. I also like the beginning quote, but that's so long. But LaRouche says, look up on a clear night. Are the stars still there? If so, be assured that your mortal life has a purpose within the higher purpose unfolding for mankind as a whole. Develop your talent for that purpose. Use that talent for that purpose. And then rejoice that you have been born to live your brief span. In that conception of yourself lies the kernel of the proper policies and strategy of our republic. Because then, even if there's hardship, your identity is totally different as a human being for mankind. So thank you, Arnold. <laughs> Steve? Yes. Um, in your in the in your article on in uh, Leonora, um, you said something provocative in the beginning, saying uh, that it's the the crisis isn't even isn't even uh, like uh, which purpose people um, choose for themselves. It's that it's 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 even more based than that. That people don't even believe in purpose at this point. They just purpose itself is a foreign concept and do you think that's uh, right I, that i'm wrong or not do you think i'm wrong i'm right in saying that oh 100 uh, percent and and further further um you don't leave us there nor does schiller um you you discuss the beautiful soul um and uh it's it's uh i'm still trying to um make clear within my own mind uh, the difference between a quote unquote beautiful soul and a sublime soul. I'm not sure if you would say that, but I don't, I don't know if there's a difference difference. If there's, I, I'm still working out the relationship, but I do know that the, the discussion has, has uh, about beauty, um, especially with Schiller. Uh, he uses the, the, the way to discuss that as beauty essentially as uh, as um, as the sensual world uh, being understood uh, with relationship to uh, reason, uh, that that this the that the seemingly chaotic moments of the sensual world, you might say, um, are uh, are not uh, are not evidence of an entropic or chaotic world, um, but um, are the uh, the effects of of a reasonable change and cause we talked about earlier and so my question really leaps from uh contemplating beauty um because again schiller says that uh he, he's sort of um he's probably annoyed his interlocutor uh when his uh the 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 recipient of his letters asks uh, how do we achieve political freedom? And he says, well, consider beauty first, because it's through beauty that we achieve political freedom. It was a very LaRouchean way to address a question. And it was, it was beautiful itself, because it's, it's, it's discussing how reason is allowing reason to, to shape our sensual effects. But then there's this question of the sublime. Um, can you talk more about uh, the beautiful soul um, in relationship to this this higher expression of of a sublime of a sublime individual acting. It's not uh, it's not so it's because it's uh, the monk. The idea of the monk uh, separating himself from sensual concern is not what we're talking about here. However, the you're almost using the same language because you're you're overcoming sensual um uh being being held down by sensual experience at any given moment you're you're almost allowing pure pure reason to um uh to be your your guide 
to guide your individual actions. I'm, I'm muffled here. Help me out, please. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think not to kind of escape you, uh, but I think we should wait with some of these questions to our Schiller readings for next week because a lot of people have not been dealing with these. Uh, uh, so, uh, but it is very interesting you're bringing it up. I like it because you, it, you're thinking about it. I just talked with Stuart today about how Schiller adds something to the aesthetic educational man through his paper on the sublime, which is seven years later. Uh, and then I have to say, I have a puppy now in a crate behind me who has to go out and pee. So if Anastasia and Stuart can just continue <laughs> and I'll get her out and back in the crate and come back with you, okay? It's nature's necessity, okay? <laughs> some 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 of, of those creatures are still bound by their sensual necessities, so <laughs> And people are also welcome to give reports on their organizing, what they've been doing. I know we've been doing a lot of phone calls because of, you know, I mean, for one, in the Midwest, it's freaking cold. I mean, just it's like 10 degrees, if not colder. So we've been making a lot of phone calls. And in fact, if any of you guys want to join in making the, some of those phone calls, you are definitely welcome to do that. We have a huge list, like literally thousands of people, uh, a lot of young people that need to be called for the meeting um on saturday so if anybody's interested in that you're definitely welcome did did uh linda were you trying to say something else or was your hand just up from before or is there anybody else that's got comments I am sorry. It was, I, it's quite another uh, thought about people in the field. Uh, when you're trying to organize people and you find uh, those you meet are sort of entrapped, whether it's culturally, whatever. I, I often wonder how you can get them to wonder about their children. Where are their children going to go? What did they think of when they had that child? The happiness, the hopes they had for that child, or even within themselves. And if one says, wait a minute, you know, did you, do you think about this for, for your child now? And when you, you actually situate themselves as a parent, then by golly, they have to be strong enough to think about their child and maybe wonder for the first time, instead of being entrapped with, you know, the, the world is so bad, blah, blah, blah. Well, how are you going to help your child? You have to give the scope of all the world to your child. You have to talk to him about the moonshot. You have to talk to him about whatever. Is it, but it is truly a question of having that love, but that's parental love, but in a good way, because we're offering them a much larger picture. This is what your child needs. This is what all children need. Will you fight then? You know, and I don't know if that helps. Perhaps, for, I don't know if that, uh, if you can touch someone on that. But the question of wonder is really, which means imagination. And in my mind, if you have a problem you can't fix, then you're lost, your imagination. There's not enough imagination involved. So that the question of the child and their, what did they hope for that kid when they had him? What did they see? What was their future, they thought? Well, why not fight for that now? But that's the same as what we're fighting for all, for all children. As you were speaking of in terms of what we need is education. I don't know, maybe, I mean, I have no idea how that, you know, in terms of on, when you're on the street. I mean, I find that a lot of people, I mean, we haven't been out in the streets for a little bit, but people that I talk to on the phone or when I am out in the streets are very interested in how do you change other people? Because that's a really big question. And when you kind of take them through the process of what we do, 
it's, it's not about like getting somebody like, oh yes, I agree with everything that you're saying. Like that's not organizing, but getting somebody to, you know, who's struggling with something, you're having a back and forth and then they figure something out and oftentimes, I mean, I even had people who were like yelling at me, calling me every dirty name in the book, end up signing up and going, oh my God, you were right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of one of those amazing things. But you express that to, to somebody who's learning how to organize and they're like, how do you do that? What are you doing? Like, what, what is it? And it's, it's what we're talking about, um, you know, tonight. That's where, having that quote from, that's where this quote from Schiller for the ninth letter is still great. Look upon people as they ought to be when you have to change them, but look upon them as they are when you have to act on their behalf. And then you don't get freaked out. Any other comments? I have a question. Who is that? Uh, Brian. Brian. Okay. Hi, Brian. Yeah. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, uh, my question uh, is this, is this agape? Uh, uh, would you say that uh, the, I mean, a person that becomes agopic obviously struggled uh, to, 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 um, really con conceptualize in a, a, a profound idea of what it, what agape is. I mean, would you say that it's not detached from, uh, I mean, be, have to get an idea of what it is. Um, oh, anyways, but that's one. Anyways. It's, see, that's why I talked earlier about the question about, which is kind of, wonderful in the way it functions, that when you really decide to strive every day to be truthful, and I mean, I will also say using a Confucian term, where, where Confucius says that you are born with five virtues, and I'm not going to go through them. But if you don't have agape, if you don't have love on that level, all the others mean nothing, which was then also developed later in the Bible. If you don't have charity or agape, not anything else doesn't count. So the only way I think that you can get a grasp on that is to fight like what helped that told me when I told her that my heart was too small, I didn't care about the whole world. She said, work on it and your heart will expand. That is the more powerful you become because you overcome yourself every day uh, in organizing, in, in uh, doing research and things that are really difficult, um, getting all different little stupid fantasies and bodily <laughs> various concerning sexualities and whatever it can be. I mean, there's a reason <coughs> that both Confucius and Socrates said that you had to be 60 or 70 in Confucius' case in order to get to a level of being a beautiful soul or <coughs> a golden soul because you don't have so many different bodily lusts as you get older and therefore it's easier. So I think in order to get to the question about agape is your daily striving to fight for truth and overcoming yourself and then liking yourself or loving yourself and then you expand your capability for loving the whole world because you see how you can become a vehicle or how you are a vehicle for change even if you're not famous it doesn't matter 
but you do what is right. And that means you are a real human being and your, your agape will expand. But it takes this fight to not do all the silly things and being contained in a very self-conscious way. And there, I mean, I would think apart from Schiller, I mean, you have wonderful writings by Lynn, what is God that man is in his, is in his image? Or uh, you probably read, or maybe not, I don't know, uh, there's no limits to growth or uh, the science of the human mind. There's many, many, I just put out some, or one that I really liked was, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with development of yourself, but uh, which was very important for me when I was young was the theory of the European monetary system. And it doesn't seem like a, a headline that has anything to do with personal development, but it has. So, and uh, so that's what I would say. It's this deciding not to be, begin to become old as Linda LaRouche want the young people in LA, when you become 25, you begin to be less creative. You begin to think about your career, money, wife, and then it's all over. And he said, don't do that. You have to continue to develop your entire life. And through doing that, you develop the capability for agape. Because of what is really human and strong in you uh, is what you will try to get for mankind. And your ideas and what you do will be for the good of everybody. Just, just. If you go to the last section. Sure, unless anyone has anything they want to jump in right now. Otherwise, we can proceed. Okay, it looks One, like we should. Two, three. <laughs> okay. So, Helga. LaRouche uh, has wished that this year, which is the year of Linda LaRouche, that we, the Schiller Chorus, will sing uh, the, at least the last part uh, of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, uh, Ode an die Freude, Ode to Joy. And I got the score yesterday, and I want to make this also a little, uh, uh, you know, join the chorus because now we are on Zoom because of the COVID and it's not very inspiring to be on Zoom singing, but uh, maybe some of you can join a few people in your living room and doing it together. Uh, but don't worry, when we are over this crisis, you know it and then we can sing it together live. So when I came to America, uh, in 1984, the Schiller Institute had just been founded. And um, when I got on calls on the phone with Americans, I told them all, what we represent, they said, who are you? I mean, we are the Schiller Institute, and what is that? So, well, just think about the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and particularly the, the, the last movement. Uh, Oh to joy, and people would not know. So I ended up singing Freude schöner Güterfunk, and I don't know how many times to people because we were organizing a march on Washington, beam the bombs uh, for Martin Luther King in 1985, in January 1985. So Helga now wants, uh, this is a song, well, let me just say this thing before would be good into it. So my idea is we would go through the text and then listen to 
five minutes of it. And then um, Stuart is going to put a link on to the whole symphony. Uh, and you should know that Beethoven worked for a couple of decades. Uh, Schiller had written this poem. Uh, Beethoven took some of the things out, but this is Schiller's poem. And Beethoven couldn't figure out how to, as Beethoven said, in order to put music to this poem, I have to, so that it forms a higher unity. And he worked on it for a couple of decades before he could do it. He did the choral fantasy uh, as a, like a starter, but then this was so what the Schiller Institute really represents. Shush, shush, what the Schiller Institute really represents is uh, this, uh, Beethoven putting Schiller's Ode to Joy to music, Ode to the Creativity, the Brotherhood of Man. So what I would like us to do is to first go through the text. Um, actually, before this, there comes a little thing where the, I think it's a bass, um, a bass uh, soloist who sings, Oh friends, no more, no more of these sounds. Let us sing more cheerful songs, more full of joy. So what I will do now, I will read the German. Uh, oh, there's some of the things. Actually, the very first line, instead of joy, bright sparks of divinity, joy, beautiful, godly sparks. And what that is, it's over here in the German, Götterfunken, is the creativity of man. Okay, so instead of bright sparks of divinity, it is beautiful, godly sparks, which uh, both refer to Benjamin Franklin with his creativity and his, uh, what do you call that now for the um, lightning rod, invention of the lightning rod. But so I will read the German and you follow in the English. And then we'll listen to the five first minutes and then Stuart will put in the link so you can listen to the whole symphony. And so I don't forget it. Uh, we are having our first chorus rehearsal tomorrow. Everyone are invited to join the Schiller Chorus, and we are going to learn this this year of Lyndon LaRouche. Okay. Freude schöner Güterfunken, Tochter aus Elysium, wir betreten Feuertrunken, himmlische dein Heiligtum. Deine Zauber binden wieder, was die Mode streng geteilt. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfter Flügel weilt. Wem der große Wurf gelungen, eines Freundes Freund zu sein, wer ein holdes Weib errungen, mische seinen Jubel ein. Ja, wer auch nur eine Seele sein nennt auf dem Erdenrund und wer's nie gekonnt, der stehle weinend sich aus diesem Bund. Go on, next. Okay. Freude trinken alle Wesen an den Brüsten der Natur. Alle Guten, alle Bösen folgen ihren Rosenspur. Küsse gab sie uns und Reben, einen Freund geprüft im Tod. Wollust ward dem Wurm gegeben und der Cherub steht von vor Gott. Froh wie seine Sonnenfliege durch des Himmels prächtigen Plan. Laufet, Brüder, eure Bahn, freudig wie ein Held zum Ziegen, as a hero going to conquest. Seid umschlungen Millionen, diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt. Brüder, über dem Sternenzelt muss ein lieber Vater wohnen. Ihr stürzt nieder, Millionen? Ahnest du den Schöpferwelt? Such ihn über dem Sternenzelt. Über Sternen muss er wohnen. Like what Linda Roos said in the little quote I read earlier, uh, look up in the stars in a clear night. Okay, are we ready for playing the five first minutes? Yes. Um, okay. I will 
just to ask Lainey, we will probably post this, in which case I would like to use the recording the Schiller Institute uh, Germans did from about, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. That way there's no copyright issues. So is that okay with you? Oh yeah. Okay, good. So I'm gonna start that and then I'll post the link um, so people can listen to the rest of it. My dogs were both singing here. <laughs> oh, all right. I didn't know 
course, the puppy would do it too, because my old dog does it all the time when we practice singing, but the little one is doing it too. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, beautiful. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Are they joining the door? Huh? What do you say, are, Brian? Are they, are they going to join the chorus tomorrow? Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, we'll have to figure it out because Nancy is coming down here with the alto. And um, uh, we have to figure out how we do it. Yeah. I think I, think I meant the dogs. Yeah. He's going to. They, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. They are joining every week. Okay. <laughs> You just come and visit Brian and try to sing and uh, the dogs sing with you. Yeah. Anyway, forget about that. So on that note, uh, Ibn Sina, one of the great Arab philosophers, also we have Al Farabi. I mean, the whole world has great people like Denmark, Ole Römer, Hans Christian Andersen, Jose Erste, you know, you know all the German great guys, Dante in Italy, Cervantes in uh, Spain, uh, Confucius. I mean, we could go on and on. So these were people that strived for, that strived for uh, uh, doing what we are talking about today, what is necessary for us to do in a complete new dark age. And the dark ages has been overcome by people like us before and we had the help of all these great people from the past so get on helga's call on saturday and uh, let's move on unless people want oh people belinda wanted to say something yes and exactly that but can you say okay uh, okay. is, you're, we're, when people say hey you can't do this yourself well, we're not by ourselves. We are holding hands with the great people in history, all of history. Imagine who these people are. <laughs> but also I wanted to mention, I don't know if you. Oh, you muted yourself, Linda. I did, sorry. Okay, that the Japanese have a, um, a tradition of singing uh, or doing the Ninth uh, Symphony, but also singing in the Chorale every New Year's Eve even in their mission on the South Pole, on Antarctica. It is always, I mean, the Americans will be doing something stupid, but the Japanese down there will be singing. <laughs> it is, it's just, I don't know if you know this, there's, there's a tradition of 10,000 people in Japan singing together or, or once a year, like people here in America would do the, the, um, the, the Messiah or something like that. Maybe I should send you a link, Janie. <laughs> It is a fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. It happened, it goes back to World War I when the German, they had German pris prisoners of war and the Germans would sing this in the prison, in, in their, um, wherever they were held. And the Japanese ask, what is this that you're singing? And what is this? And this is from then that it began. And everyone contributes, young, old, all children. It's just a fascinating, um, um, maybe there is a story behind the story, but I wish I share it with you. If you find out, let us know. Yeah. Okay. It's a very, it's universal uh, symphony. It's really exactly. it talks yeah. for the whole world. Yeah. Exactly. So. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Um, that was a. A lot of fun and hopefully people got some ideas and some inspiration and let's go forth and become uh in enormous people <laughs> well hopefully so, uh, not yeah. with uh covid kilos you know no a different kind of enormity <laughs> okay well thanks everybody for tuning in and um yes keep in touch we will be having this event on um, Saturday for those of you who are under, um, you know, 35 or so. Um, and uh, everyone else, please stay in touch, stay involved, and, um, and we'll see you again soon.